Astronomy Cast, episode 288 from Monday, January 7th, 2013. Phases of Matter. Yes. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Fraser? Doing great. Uh, I know you're very cold, so uh, so hopefully this will be one of those shows that you don't slip into some kind of uh, hypothermic uh, state. <laughs> Yeah, and pass out in the middle of the show. Um, now, have you got any interesting things happening on CosmoQuest that we might want to mention? Um, we are beta testing Mercury mappers. We are going live with a whole series of Google Hangouts that are related to Astronomy Cast. And um, I think pretty much all of us, and this includes you, are going to be at Science IO this year. So That's right. If you're going to be at Science IO, make sure to come by, say hi, and we might even have swag in our pocket to hand to you. I'm going to be doing a talk on the virtual star parties at Science.io, so Excellent. about 15 minutes, yeah, and I'm, and I'm, try, I'm going to try to get a live, going to get some astronomy happening live as well while we're doing it, so, awesome. so we'll see. Yeah, it should be fun. Uh, great. Now, one quick thing. Um, if, uh, if you're listening to the show and you really love it, uh, if you could go to iTunes and write a review for us, that would be super fantastic. Uh, because, uh, you know, the more reviews, that helps pop us up to the top of the rankings and the listings, and then when people are looking for shows to listen to, uh, they'll see ours and, and give it a shot, and that really helps us out. So, you know, if you have a few seconds and you've never reviewed Astronomy Cast, that would help us a ton, and that's over on iTunes. Just do a search for, for Astronomy Cast on iTunes, and then there's a way to review. And if you're not a member of iTunes, you don't like Apple, whatever, don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, we're, not, we're not, you know, going to hold your feet to the fire. Okay, cool. So as we learn early on with water, matter can be in distinct phases, solid, liquid, gas, and plasma. It all depends on temperature and pressure. But why do different materials require different temperatures? And what's actually happening to the atoms themselves as the material switches phases? Uh, yeah, so, so I think I can remember chemistry class, physics class, uh, you know, back in high school as we started to delve into the phases of matter. And at one point the teacher said, and there's plasma. And I was like, what? <laughs> What's, what? Yes. I know it's solid, liquid, and gas, but plasma? So, uh, so can we kind of take a step back then and uh, sort of talk about, I guess, early scientists starting to delve into this idea of, of the phases of matter? What's going on here? Well, I, I, I think this is one of those things that's pretty much uh, at, as far back as people have attempted to conduct science. We've had basic ideas of elemental forces, elementals in general, earth, fire, water, air. And part of trying to break down this universe we live in was trying to understand how things transition between uh, just solid, liquid gas and the only things that we had for a long time a firm understanding were things like metals which you have to make fairly liquid in order to make all the cool things you need to wage war like swords um, and then clearly things like water where we went from ice to drinkable to steam um, but trying to understand this there there is this basic notion of heat something up, make a fire, fire changes the state, and uh, then when things cool off, the state changes in the other direction. And I guess it does, I mean, they knew pretty early on that water in the solid form and water in the liquid form and water in the gas form were water. Were, were all the same thing, that they were all, they were all water. I mean, and they got pretty comfortable with that idea that you could, you could move these elements back and forth. But I mean, they had some pretty goofy ideas about just you know, like the different elements, earth, air, fire, water. I mean, how did that all, I mean, alchemical, how did that all play into it? Well, it, for the most part, uh, that, that I have to admit is beyond what I prepped for this show. Uh, oh. You didn't <laughs> prep the whole alchemy part? Okay. No, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, so, so, so in general, trying to figure out um, 
the, the basics really took until we started getting to the modern scientific revolution, uh, up until we really started understanding that atoms exist. It, it was hard to, to comprehend what gas is when we couldn't separate out the different constituencies of gas. So, so the phases of matter, well, the big picture idea of solid liquid gas is an old concept. The scientific understanding of it is only a few hundred years old. And so, you know, what were some of the early scientific experiments that started to tease out what was really going on here? You are asking questions. I totally did not prep you want for people? this week. How do you how do you want to approach this? <laughs> I was planning to actually. What are the scientific phases of matter? Discuss oh, the through. phases. Sure, no problem. You're going into history. No, no problem. No problem. <laughs> Sorry, all of you are getting to see the sausage made today. <laughs> no problem. We'll, we'll we'll roll back then. No problem. Okay. Um, okay. So then, what's actually going on here? As as you know, when we've got our water uh, turning into ice, or we've got it turning into gas or plasma. Uh, what's actually going on? So, so what we're doing is we're changing how the different atoms or molecules of a different compound are, are connected to one another. When you're dealing with a gas, the, the atoms are completely not connected to one another. So they're flying free, undergoing collisions where they bounce off of each other, and, and they, they have no bonds keeping them as part of a whole. When you start to deal with liquids, you've cooled things down enough so that their velocities, when they come together, they kind of stick. And then as, as you have multiples coming together, these two might go to being connected and these two become connected. So you have more like a square dance of atoms and molecules where they, they slowly change off how they're generally ionically bound to one another. Um, but, but then as you cool things down even further, then you start to build solid bonds where these two and these two and these two and all of the different combinations lock into place in various ways. And depending exactly on the atomic structure of what you're dealing with, in some cases you can get beautiful crystal formation. In other cases you just sort of end up with a haphazard mixing of the different atoms and molecules as they come together into a solid. So these are the three. You can end up some special plasma is still a special form of gas. Um, but in the case of plasma, you end up with with the electrons are excited, and as they bounce between different energy levels and actually leave their host atoms and molecules, they they give off light. So when you're looking at a fluorescent light bulb, that's a plasma. When you're looking at a star, that's a plasma too. Uh, but then when you go the other direction to a Bose-Einstein condensate, which is where you cool special types of gas down to a millionth of a degree or so, um, at that point they take on very special atomic properties again. And in this case you end up with a really funky clump of material where all of the atoms uh, achieve the lowest energy states they can while not having overlapping energy states. Now is is a a Bose is a Bose Einstein condensate 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 um, yes. is that an, a special form of matter? I mean, does it work as one of the phases of matter? It's depending on who you talk to. They're either going to call it a special state of matter or a special phase of matter. It's definitely not a solid. This is something where uh, they they typically make Bose Einstein condensates out of rubidium atoms, and when they supercool these rubidium atoms, they they end up. Uh, clumping up into a very strangely moving blob. So it's, it's this weird other. Um, and it's not determined by the bonding like you do between solid, liquid, and gas, but rather it's, it's defined by the energy levels of the specific atoms and how they all strive to get to the lowest possible energy level that they can. I think it's absolutely fascinating how they they do this, right? They, don't they shoot a laser at the rubidium atoms to to extract energy from them until they move it's, into this stage? It's, it's a two-step process to create a Bose-Einstein condensate. The first step is uh, you, you have a set of magnetically um, bound together rubidium atoms, but they're all moving in a swarm, and that movement has its own energy. So as long as those suckers are moving, you, you can't achieve 
well a millionth of a degree. And so they tune lasers to slowly but surely uh, confine the velocities of these atoms down to a smaller and smaller and smaller velocity. Uh, and, and they actually have to do things like take into account what is the, the specific Doppler shifted energy level of the electrons inside of the rubidium. And it, because they've, they've color matched the color of the laser to the color of the transition of the electrons in the rubidium at a specific the rubidium is moving velocity. Uh, they're, they're able to change the velocity uh, in much the same way as you might imagine uh, someone is rolling it slows down their velocity. It's kind of a crazy process but it works and as they slowly tune the color of the laser they're able to get the rubidium atoms moving at lower and lower and lower velocities and so that's step one uh, step two they they actually uh, use evaporative cooling so just like you cool off by evaporating water off of your surface um, sweating is a more normal way of saying that um, they are able to cool off the rubidium by stripping away the faster moving rubidium off of the surface. Now does anything change with the the property of the matter apart from just the way the molecules are 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 bouncing around you know whether they're locked in in you know like soldiers in the you know the Bose-Einstein condensate or if they're you know in a solid or in a liquid or a gas does anything change about the the matter's nature? Well, the, the first thing that was noticed is when they were creating the first Bose-Einstein condensates, almost, they didn't quite get it cold enough, but when they were first trying to create Bose-Einstein condensates out of uh, helium-4, they, they noticed they created what's called a superfluid. This is a fluid that, that experiences no frictional forces as it flows. And, and so this weird absolute lack of friction is is one of the cooler properties as you approach getting to a Bose-Einstein condensate. Uh, then you also end up with basically everything um, when you you look at uh, the distribution of it, it will spread itself out in funky ways. You end up with material trying to climb the sides of containers. Um, it just behaves in odd ways. But one of the problems that we have is it takes a whole lot of effort, a whole lot of energy to create one of these Bose-Einstein condensates. And that sounds kind of strange that it takes a ton of energy to cool something off so that it has no energy in it. But that's the reality of what we're doing. And um, so we can only create basically minuscule amounts of this. And, and so we don't fully understand all the properties yet because we're, we're just not creating it in large amounts yet. But as you move from, say, solid to liquid, or liquid to gas, or even gas to plasma, does the you know does the does the matter itself take on different properties, you know, chemically, or you know, you know what I mean, like, or is it just the same stuff, just in that different? <laughs> well, state? the the atoms are certainly staying the same, um, but what's changing is the kinematic motions, and and the kinematic motions. That a certain degree decide how well atoms are or aren't bound to one another. So uh, depending on the situation, when you, when you have a solid, you have all of these atoms that, that are very close to one another and in some cases are what's called ionically bound to one another. Ionic bonds are when two atoms are sharing electrons back and forth. Um, but it, it's, it's not that hardcore bond that you get for things like H2O, which is a covalent bond. Um, so just these, I happen to be missing three, three electrons, you happen to be missing, uh, it, it's just the empty spaces between two atoms. I don't have the right finger coordination to do this. Uh, yeah, I forget it. Um, don't have coordination to do it, but but if you have if you have atoms that when you put them together, their electrons essentially create one complete shell of electrons. Um, it's like two puzzle pieces where one has has the the sticky outy bits that mix, mix, matches the other one's any bits. Um, atoms do that as well, and and it's through those types of ionic sharing of electron bonds that that you're able to get a metallic solid, for instance.
Now, I mean, is that one of the sort of one of the situations like with water? I know that when water freezes, it actually becomes less dense, right? And uh, and floats up on top of the, uh, you so, know, on so top of the water. Water is a bizarre substance. Um, it, it's one of the very few things that does become less dense as it becomes a solid. And what's happening here is in liquid, as the atoms flow past one another very temporarily, uh, sharing one another's electrons, but in a very loose session a very loose way where the kinetic energies that uh, are causing the atom, the molecules to flow, those kinetic energies are greater than the binding energies that are trying to hold the, the atoms together. Um, as they cool, as those motions slow down, the atoms form crystalline structures and it's the nature of that crystalline structure that, that causes the atoms to get pushed apart into very specific configurations that cause the solid to end up having a much lower density uh, than the liquid does. Now, we, now, obviously we've experienced this, you leave an ice cube out on your on your table and it's gonna it's gonna melt so this is a phase change what is sort of going on with these with these phase changes what what is what is what needs to be there for you to be able to get these changes well it, in order to go from one phase to the other you have to add energy to the system that gets the atoms moving gets the molecules moving depending on what it is um, so so when you take for instance lead say you have a lead I hope it's not a food implement because lead is slightly poisonous. Lead fork? No. Um, no. Let's go. Let's go with iron. Iron won't kill you as as, sure. as readily. Uh, so let's say you have a nice iron, old-fashioned dagger of some sort. I don't know why, but you do. It's a nice, friendly solid. Now, if you dagger, take dagger, da really? Well, anyway, I won't. <laughs> I won't question your your analogies. Please continue. Um, so if you take something that will release energy when burned like wood, um, when it releases that energy, it releases it in the form quite often of infrared and other forms of light. And so you stick the dagger uh, on top of the fire and it's probably going to have to concentrate it onto that dagger. It, uh, the, the atoms will start trying to move, trying to move, trying to move, and eventually the, the heat energy that's been injected into those vibrating, moving atoms uh, are going to exceed the binding energies, and it's going to begin to melt. Now, eventually, were you to use something a whole lot hotter than wood, um, a whole lot more... Uh, releasing of energy, you could actually convert that into a gas, in which case you've completely broken down all the abilities of the atoms to bond onto one another and their kinetic energy is so great that they simply bounce off of one another when they come near instead of bonding to one another. And if you go the other way, right, I mean you're, if you're extracting energy from the system, heat from the system, well, extracting energy is a difficult process involving laser beams. Well, uh, <laughs> if if things are cooling down, it, it, if something is able to radiate its its heat off into the surroundings using its own infrared radiation, so this is you take your red hot dagger and you set it aside, and that red hot is IR radiation and optical radiation escaping um, as it as it cools down. Um, it's it's losing energy to its environment, so losing energy to the molecules of gas around it, losing energy in all sorts of ways, thermal transfer to the surface underneath it, and as it cools down, the kinetic energy of the molecules is slowing down, and, and eventually you have all of the atoms pretty much locked together into this solid form. Now, you can get situations where um, matter can jump forms, right? You can get things that will go from, say, solid to directly to gas. I can think about like carbon dioxide, right? Frozen carbon it's dioxide. It's sublimate, yes. Yeah. So, so there's entire what are called phase diagrams and uh, at different points, there's for instance a triple point of water where at just the right temperature, pressure, density combination, you can have water going from solid to liquid to gas with just the, the slightest changes and, and so this is that magic triple point where water can exist pretty much in all three phases depending on which direction you approach it from. And, and 
depending on the density pressure, you get lots of different things that can go from this solid to gas phase. Uh, on the moon, you ha can have water ice that sublimates straight into water gas. Uh, on, on the surface of Mars, uh, you can have carbon dioxide or water. Both of them will go straight from solid to gas. Uh, and this is simply a matter of at these pressures, uh, there, there's nothing holding the atoms together and as they go from being bound together into a solid they simply bypass that stage where they're slightly bound together as a liquid and go straight into a gaseous form. And so pressure is is the kind of the magic ingredient with this. I know, you know, when you buy a hiking stove, if you're going to go up in a high altitude and you want to boil water, it takes you less a time. A lot longer. It takes you longer, that's right, because the pressure is lower. Right. Uh, um, so, you know, you can have situations as well where you have conditions of very high pressure that change everything as well. Like, you can think about passing down through Jupiter, where I think what they have, like, tons of different, even just different types of water ice. Well, what, what's interesting is you can... Uh, I actually boil things simply by changing the pressure under which it is. So you can end up boiling water by lowering the pressure that it's under. Um, you can turn nitrogen into a gas, uh, nitrogen into a liquid by increasing the pressure that it's under. So when you're trying to figure out what phase of matter that you're looking at, uh, you have to consider the pressure, the, the density of the atoms, the temperature, and it, it's from all three of these things that we're able to figure out what phase that we should mathematically have at the end of the day. So what are some extreme environments that maybe we can find unusual situations? I mean, you mentioned one already, which is that if you've got ice on the moon, it's going to be sublimating directly from ice right into, into gas. Um, another situation is that you can, you know, in Jupiter, you can go down through Jupiter and encounter different kinds of ice, which are... Well, and, and there pressure, you're looking... Right? And, and there, it's, to be specific, you're dealing with different types of gaseous ices. Yeah. And, and, and so while water does have different crystalline structures, depending largely on how quickly or how slowly you cool it down, um, I, I, I think that the best way to consider this is to look at Titan. It's a methane environment that's very similar to Earth. Here at Earth, our environment allows water to be uh, liquid, solid, or gas, depending on... It, very minor differences just in your kitchen. Uh, if you go to Titan, you have the exact same boundary conditions for methane, where you have methane rain falling from the sky, methane ice on the surface, methane gas in the atmosphere. And, and so it, to me, I guess I, I've, I've dealt with thinking about this for so long that it's not weird or extreme. It's just that's the way Titan is. It's plenty weird. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just so you know. Just okay. All right. But, but I think the most interesting application of this, in in some regards, is uh, if you very, very slowly cool down um, water ice, you can end up with perfectly clear ice that looks more like glass than like your normal has all sorts of white flaws in it ice cube. And one interesting application of this is if you make a perfectly spherical uh, ice cube with no flaws in it, it will melt slower and you can use it in whiskey to have whiskey that is at the correct temperature is to water down. So it, it's always good how to know how to use chemistry to create the perfect glass of whiskey. <laughs> right, of course. I'll, I'll, I'll use that um, in, in, in scotch. But uh, so, okay, so what about really extreme places? Like what about, uh, you know, the surface of neutron stars and inside white dwarfs and things like that? I mean, is it still just solid or have you reached some other phase of matter? I mean, they call well, it de degenerate matter, right? it, Sorry, electron degenerate gas. And, and this is... Again, one of the things that it's hard to think of it as a different phase of matter, but it's definitely a different behavior at the atomic level. So this doesn't have as much to do with the kinetic properties of matter the way solid liquid gas has to do with the kinetic properties, but, but rather this has to do with, with how the electrons and the poly-exclusion principle come into play.
So with, with both Einstein condensates, you have to worry about what are the energy levels of the atoms, and the atoms each actually only have specific allowed energies. Well, with an electron degenerate gas and a white dwarf, what you're worrying about is what are the energy levels of all of the electrons, because the atoms are so tightly packed together that the electrons basically form a crystalline structure where they're trying to avoid having two atoms with the, the exact same uh, spin-up, spin-down characteristics in the same energy level. Poly exclusion principle won't allow that, and, and so you end up with a latest work of electrons that, that your atomic nuclei are suspended within. So it's still a phase of matter then? I mean, it's still... Well, it's... It's a gas? It's, I mean, it's a crystal, so yeah. it's a solid. Yeah. Um, electron degenerate stars are, for the most part, solids, and we think that they're, they're uh, carbon atoms form diamonds, actually. Uh, but it's the electrons that have this quantum mechanical defined nature uh, that says the electrons can only get this close together and no closer. And, and so thinking of it as a different phase of matter isn't entirely how a chemist would, would want you to think of it, I don't think, but it is a different behavior of the, of the matter at a quantum level. So the last thing I'd like to talk about is plasma, and obviously the uh, the sun is what is it a miasma of incandescent plasma? No. Yeah, yeah. So they might be giant song. Yes. Um, uh, but uh, right. So, uh, like, what's going on here? What is? How do you turn a gas into a plasma? And what is the nature of plasma? Well, so so plasma is a special type of gas. So if, if you're trying to do the mathematics of how do the atoms move, how do they collide off of one another, that's still all related to standard gas laws. What makes a plasma different is the electrons in plasma are excited to higher levels. And, and excited things, excited electrons, don't stay excited permanently. And as they cascade back down to the lower energy levels, they give off light. So day to day the gas around us is not emitting light this is good because if the air in this room were emitting light I couldn't see my screen in front of me uh, so so plasmas tend to be just they're so busy giving off light the light can't get through them uh, this this light that's bouncing around inside the the plasma actually helps feed the system because uh, a photon emitted in the transition of one atom can go out, hit another atom, cause it to get excited, and so you end up with this feeding system. But due to the random nature of the directions that the light is coming off, uh, you, you do end up with light eventually being emitted. And, and lasers are actually a special case of this where you end up with, with coherent stimulated emission. And we've done an entire show on this that you can go back and listen to. So, so with a plasma, you simply have overexcited electrons that, that are uh, getting excited through the various collisions and through uh, energy being driven into the system in your fluorescent bulb. It's the electricity from the wall. Uh, in the sun, it's the nuclear reactions going on in the center of the sun. And whatever the source of energy that's exciting all of the atoms, their electrons are the ones that are expressing that excitement by... Uh, getting excited and then collapsing and giving off light in the process of the collapse. But you get some interesting properties with plasma. I mean, one, it glows, it glows. You know, with, a, with a neon sign. That's nice, and it's good that it's not filling the air. But also, I mean, we get situations where plasma coming from the sun interacts with the Earth's magnetic field. And... This, they're charged particles at yeah, this stage. Yeah, and so you've got the situation where now you can move it around with a magnet. And and I, I think moving it around with a magnet is, is a very strange way to think of it because now I have this idea of, of you can move a magnet around on various types of plasma and actually see the things moving. But magnetic fields is, is actually what that magnetic is, magnet is creating. And um, the, the magnetic field... Uh, Moving, char moving charged particles generate a magnetic field, and magnetic fields move charged particles. It's this neat dynamic interplay. And, and so the plasma, when it's in motion, gener generates magnetic fields, and standing magnetic fields can move the plasma. So that's, that's just kind of cool. That is really cool. So do you think there will be any more phases of matter ever discovered, or has it sort of been fully explained? Um, 
I, I think in terms of, of the kinetic states of energy, I, I think we're good. In terms of weird quantum mechanical states, we still don't know what the heck to make of the inside of a black hole. So I, I think just like Bose-Einstein condensates are a weird quantum mechanically defined structure, just like electron degenerate gases are a weird quantum mechanic defined way of mass being. I think inside of black holes we have yet to figure out what the heck that is and there's the potential for it to either be just raw bits particle physics at play or maybe even some new structure we can't imagine. Let's just assume Let's just assume it's another form of matter. We just can't. Yeah, you know. I don't do that. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thank you very much, Pamela. That was great. My pleasure. Right. So don't go anywhere. We're just going to save. And sniffle. Uh -huh. um, sorry, I, I think my kids gave that to you. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've had it ever since the cruise. Yes. <clears throat> Export, and then we're good. Um, cool. And I know a few people are going to join us. Um, so, if you want to join us in the in this, um, uh, by all means, uh, drop um, drop a note. And I, in in the Google Plus in the event, and I will I will invite you into the Hangout as long as you promise to behave. Yes. <clears throat> um, right. So um, okay. So a few things. So thanks everybody who was posting some comments. I actually did borrow quite a few ideas from the from all the comments. So uh, so Jeff Boris just said I suggest that you strongly consider a follow up show about all the ice types or all of a lot of the phases. Um, didn't mention all the phases or the one that was discovered a few weeks ago, things you're lacking quite a bit of info. So um, were you aware of a new type of water ice, a new type of ice that was These announced? These are, I, th I think, the way to think of this is different. It's not different phases of matter. It's different crystalline structures. And and that's that's a different topic than phases of matter. So just like carbon atoms can, can be formed into a variety of different structures depending on how you cool them. Uh, water ice can be formed into a variety of different structures, but it's still a solid. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but no, I mean, I think a, a, a whole show on all the different kinds of ice would be fantastic. I'd love that. So, You um, like chemistry far more than I do. I do. My son is a total chemistry nerd. It's hilarious. He will watch YouTube videos of chemistry reactions all day long. Yeah. Loves it. Um, especially that one. Have you seen that one where it's like some kind of, I don't know what no. it is. It turns I know I into like tentacles. It. it turns into like crazy tentacles. It's really cool. Oh, is that Ublik on a speaker? No, that's a whole other thing that they think is really cool. Non-Tonian hey. fluids. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Dad. How's it going? Hey, how are you doing? Good. Um, uh, yeah, and thanks for reminding me about uh, They Might Be Giants. And uh, um, and there's a few questions about the degenerate matter and stuff. So that was that was fantastic. Thank you very much for, for posting those comments. That, that helped me out a lot. Um, okay, so let's see if we've got some questions here. So feel free to ask any questions. You can post questions into, um, if you're using it on Twitter, you can use the hashtag AstronomyCast. If you're using uh, YouTube, you can post your comment there. If you're watching this on the event, you can post your comment there. Or if you're watching this in your feed, you can post a question or comment there. Um, all right. Uh, so Alan Thompson is asking a question. What is quantum spin liquid? Has anyone heard of that? Thad, do you know? So, so for reference, Thad has been brought in because he used to be a condensed matter physicist, and I have forever been an astronomer. So, so he knows more about these weird chemistry properties, whereas I come from a world of hydrogen, helium, and everything else. And I like my world, but he likes his. So we'll get to that. So let's, it's been a while since I've, I've dealt with... Um, these states of matter where it's it's based purely on these quantum mechanical properties but but some you can have things where you align the spins in kind of a, a 
Um, so there, there's there's some angle that you can define between what the, the angular momentum are as, as you go through. So you can propagate. I mean, typically we, we think of a like a wave moving through matter as places where it gets compressed or spread out. Um, you can do that with the spin properties in a matter as well. So it's kind of you know it's related to the magnetic moment of the matter. So if you're if you're um, doing things in high magnetic fields, um, you can start to create some of these exotic states. You also need to really lower the temperature because there's always a competition between thermal motion. If you have some thermal excitation, you can completely wipe this out. Um, and trying to bring out the, the energies involved to get the spins to kind of line up in different states. So typically, if you're talking about some of these exotic states, and it's again kind of similar to what you have to do with the Bose-Einstein condensate, is really drop the temperature and sometimes apply an incredible magnetic field to get these to go. So sorry if that's not a really specific thing about uh, answer about the quantum spin states, but man, it's it's you know, I was the last at the National High Magnetic Field Lab in 1997, so it's been a little while. <laughs> Um, Colin Hagemeyer notes that the ultimate goal of science is how to improve our consumption of alcohol. <laughs> Largely, yes. I think that's true. Uh, Paul Mansfield notes that freeze-dried coffee is made by making coffee and then using a low pressure to reduce the boiling point of water and thus force evaporate the water and leave behind a soluble coffee as a solid. And, and they also uh, make um, milk powder, dehydrated milk in a very similar process. When I was at Michigan State University, uh, the chemical engineering students had things, had homework assignments like make powdered such and such. And, and so I got to hear all of these things as people came back from their homework covered in things like burnt, dehydrated, this, that, and the other thing. Um... Also, one point I just want to be uh, careful of here with our, our definition of phases of matter, because the, the underlying scientific definition is how much order is there in the system. And so the most ordered system is something that is crystalline. You pick an atom, you know exactly how far to move and in what direction to get to the next atom or molecule, like in the case with water or if you're like freezing carbon dioxide or something. And so as long as you start at one, anytime you move that distance, you get to another atom, and that is perfectly ordered. So that is that is a solid. You get amorphous solids, like glass, where the molecules are frozen in place with respect to one another, but you can't, and there's, there's a, a spacing between them that's constant, but you can't pick which direction to move in to get to the next atom. So it's it's a little more random. It's not liquid. This is one thing that the, you see things posted out there like window panes in old buildings get thicker at the bottom because it's it's not. Yeah. It is a solid. Um, but we do have phases of matter in between solids and liquids and most of you are probably experiencing one of these right now watching this broadcast because you're looking at a liquid crystal display. And so the idea here is if you get long molecules that you can create order by stacking them certain ways. So for instance, you can get rows of molecules, and you don't know where exactly one molecule is with respect to the next, but then some distance above it, you get another row, row of molecules, and then another row above that. And the spacing between the rows is extremely well defined. So that's liquid crystal, or more like the type that you're looking at right now if you're watching this. Well, because you have these long molecules, if you pack them in tightly enough or you cool the temperature enough, they'll all tend to line up in one direction. And these tend to respond. You, there may be no way of telling where one molecule is with respect to another, to another and that's a property of a liquid. But the average, there's an average spacing, and now there's an average direction. And these respond very well to electric fields. So you click an electric field on, and that pixel turns on on your screen. You click the electric field in another direction, and now the pixel um, turns off. So this is, I mean, how you're probably watching this right now is, is on a liquid crystal display of some sort. And so it's taking advantage of these flippy properties and getting them to flip very quickly in these uh, what they're called pneumatic liquid crystals. So... So are phases, I have a question, are phases um, somewhat not defined? Is it like a continuum between phases? It's not so much a continuum as, as there's, there's a transition of some order parameter. Um, if 
temperature changes involved if heat is gained or lost in a phase transition it's called the first order phase transition and so if you say for instance for water you get it to zero degrees Celsius and at that point any more heat that you take away so let's say you're lowering water from zero degrees Celsius any more heat that you take away doesn't change the temperature all it does is it starts to lock the molecules in place with respect to one another. So it stays at zero degrees Celsius and then any more heat you take away causes um, it to go from liquid to solid. And then once you get all of it in a solid phase, now as you take heat away, now it drops below zero degrees Celsius. So if there's what's called latent heat involved, it's a first order tra phase transition. Now there can be things with magnetic field change or oh, what were some of the other ones? You know, but yeah, sometimes, sometimes magnetic field properties, again, it's been a while. It's been almost 15 years. It's more yeah. than 15 years at this point. But if it's not, if, if the temperature changes continually, but there's some other thing that, that some other property of the thing, thing that shifts, then it's a second order phase transition. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's a little, it's a little difficult to say that there's, a continual everything. There's always some order parameter that has to have a distinct break. So if you're making a graph, right, so for instance you, you're graphing how much heat there is that you put in, um, let's say you you put that on um, on this axis, right, so here, uh -huh. right? The, the lower you, third axis. The lower, the lower <laughs> third axis, right, and you put the temperature on this axis. If you watch something that is melting, for instance, first right. order transition. You add heat, you add heat. Oops! Now you're at the the transition temperature, and now any heat you add, you can add more heat, but the temperature doesn't change. Right. And then once you're all melted, it goes back up again. So what you look for is a, a discontinuity in one of these graphs, and that tells you, hey, we've got a phase transition of some sort. Okay. So, so I've got some more questions here before you guys just keep completely uh, geeking out here. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so, Snow McKenzie asks, if changing state is an energy transfer, you can get to absolute zero, can you get to absolute hot? Is that, is there an absolute hot? So, so absolute hot would be Not so hot. Not making a joke. <laughs> Shush. Um, so, so, absolute hot, in the scientific sense, would, would have to correspond to it's so expletive hot and so expletive dense that matter no longer exists and everything becomes pure energy, and that's called the Big Bang. That okay. will do it. There you go. Um, well, it's okay. So uh, Doak Wilford asked sort of the same question. So we will. Uh, we'll okay. Can I ask another together. slightly geeky question? Cause... No. <laughs> Please. Okay. All right. Dad, I, want, I, I need to know this. You because... promised to behave, Nicole. <laughs> I, okay. No, I didn't actually. Oh, that's <laughs> you didn't. I like you didn't. <laughs> oh. Okay, because when they teach phases of matter in elementary school, it's a very, at least when they did when I was in elementary school, it's a very basic, here are the properties of solid, here are the properties of liquid, here are the properties of gas. And I think I stumped one of my, like, third or fourth grade teachers by asking, well, what phase of matter is peanut butter? So can you tell me what phase of matter is peanut butter? <laughs> it's a colloid. So <laughs> it's a colloid. Okay. It's solid immersed in liquid, and they're oh. in with each other. Um, this see, is why you end up with the oil separating from the peanut goodness. Right, you, you let it sit long enough, and then you have to mix the two back together again. Oh, so, what see, about, it never lasts long enough around me. What about whipping cream? Um, that is when also a colloid. It's um, air in solid colloid. Oh. Right? So my you, son asked me that one, and we had to look it up. He, we, I think it, it's an emulsion, right? Yeah, so, I mean, emulsion, colloid, I mean, the other... Yeah. It's, Essentially, you, you have two phases of matter, and you mix them together in a certain way okay. to provide, like an aerogel, for instance. So you have this very solid lattice structure in there, but a lot of it is this huge amount of, of empty space. So, you know, I'm, I'm probably using colloid too loosely, uh, is it. But again, you can combine two different um, phases of matter and, and get something that has different properties, like peanut butter. And okay. it's tasty, too. It this answers like a burning so question. So it is a life. liquid and a solid mixed yeah. together. Right. Yeah. So Nicole, or a oh. liquid and a gas mixed together or a solid and a gas. Okay. Crunchy cool. or creamy? Crunchy. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Gary Ray asks, uh, how much material science did you study for astronomy? Is that a good area Zero. for future? Zero. Future astronomy to study. Thanks from an old material scientist. <laughs> 
Sadly, zero. None. Yeah, I had to. T I took a torturous path to my PhD, and so I, I made the mis. I mean, it was it was very interesting looking at at solids and liquids and gases, and I got to play with some weird states of matter, um, along the way. But um, at, at some point, I thought, well, I I want to do something practical with my PhD, and I figured, you know, well, if I, well, if I do this, I can, I can have me conductors and whatever. And so when I first applied to grad school, I was going for condensed matter physics because. Um, Kind of given up on some of my dreams at that point. Not a good idea ever. No, don't um, do that. Yeah, yeah. So, but eventually came back to them, and and so now the the focus is astronomy. But I picked up a lot of cool stuff along the way. Like you know, you have a lab where liquid nitrogen essentially flows like water. It's like, oh, I want to go get some, and you yes. go over to the big tank, and you just get a cup out and styrofoam cup, and you're swirling your finger. Around. See, finger still here, not a prosthetic. Yeah. yeah. Um, but you don't want to do that for too long. You know, just stick it and leave it in there because th then it won't be there. No, and you <laughs> but, have to maintain the constant motion. Yes. So. Right. right. No, but but for for those of us who have just astronomy degree, I think I'm probably the worst example of lack of chemistry. Uh, I I took PCAM my senior year undergrad. Never took orgo. I uh, never took basic chemistry. I simply took PCAM, which is a fancy way of saying I took quantum mechanics in the chemistry department. And and so my universe is things at the atomic scale, hydrogen, helium, and everything else. So I, I wonder if I had the most of all of you because we did, did tons engineer. of it in engineering. Yeah. yeah. Oh, you, yeah. Honestly, the last chemistry class, formal class I took was 10th grade. Yeah. But along the way, there's a lot of statistical mechanics and then just a lot of reading of papers on your own. So you understand, okay, well, if you make molybdenum 4, oxygen 11, then the bonds are going to be like this, and you have to look at these properties. Or if you're going to build a liquid crystal, okay, you have to stack a whole bunch of carbons. DNA actually makes a pretty decent liquid crystal, strangely <laughs> enough. Really? That um, would yeah. be so awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to break it up, and you get these nice pair, but it's this long helical molecule, and if it's short enough, those are good rigid rods, and you essentially um, reduce the amount of liquid in there, they start to bunch up, and you get... Um, so we could genetically engineer our LCD hey. monitors. This Organic. Is, is that... It'd be, it'd, it'd be an awfully inefficient way to do it, but yes. <laughs> and actually, no. And But no, you couldn't make an LCD monitor out of it because the response to the electric field is not strong enough. Okay. Right. Yeah. You want things to switch fast. So, so yeah. I got another question, but, you know... Well, anyway, okay, I'm going to move on. Uh, so we got another question. This comes from, because we could talk about that all day. Uh, yeah. So this comes from Graham Stickings. Um, uh, now, I'm not exactly sure what he's talking about, but what about supercooled fluids and the pitch drop experiment? Are you guys aware of the pitch drop experiment? No, this is what Google is for. Come on, Google. Yeah. Pitch drop. Pitch drop, yeah, I've never heard about that. But I wonder if that's a fluids. frequency thing, that the, p the pitch of sound traveling through it. It's a long-term experiment which measures the flow of a piece of pitch over many years. Mm. Oh, yes. Mm. Oh, it's University mm. of Queensland demonstrating the viscosity. Um, so this is something that is an extraordinarily high viscosity fluid. And because it's such high, vi high viscosity, this means the, the atoms and molecules, or in this case just molecules, while they flow to connecting one to another, um, they, they, they do it in such a slow rate that you can actually see all of the fluid flow basically slowed down. So instead of having to use a high-speed camera to observe fluid dynamics with water, uh, you use several generations and a thing of pitch. Hmm. Um, so Jeff, uh, Jeff Borst just mentioned, I'm loving this, great info, please consider a states show. So what do you mean by states? Do you mean states of matter or do you mean like do a show in the United States? <laughs> they're all in the United States. I'm in Canada. Um, Tom Roslin asks, could you repeat how long light takes to exit the center of a star once it's initiated? Oh. Anywhere between 10,000 and several million years. It's a yeah, random Several walk. million for the sun, I think, right? I think yeah. ten to the seven, something. I don't like think that. it's ten to the seven. It's it's on the order of ten to the five to ten to the six. Okay, okay. Um, but still, you're talking about a random process. It's like, hey, yeah, I'm a photon. Motion. I want to get out. What path am I going to take? Okay, I'm trying this way, this way, this way. And so, if you take all of those little steps, and my students love this because it's the the, the 
the classic analogy is the drunken man walks drunken over. Drunken photons. So he just starts stumbling around in front of the class, and it seems to be that's the most remembered thing from Does any it work class. best if you actually get drunk first? No. No. It's so it's 17,000 to 50 million years. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. That's and funny. The average is around a million. So, I mean, it's a, right. it's a you know, there's there's very few that get out in 17,000. There's a peak around one million, and then there's some that just, where the heck is the exit? So, yeah. <laughs> they get close, and then they wander back to the middle, and yeah. And um, then it takes eight minutes to get to us for, once it gets out of right. the sun. Right. Yeah. Is amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So, then, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, and, uh, Owen, oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I've moved on. I okay. sensed a pause in the conversation, and I've moved on. Uh, but no, go ahead, Dad. I was going to mention neutrinos, because, I mean, they're going to form in the same reaction that creates the gamma rays, and in two seconds, boom, they're out of the sun. They're right. on their way through space, because they just, what, matter? I don't care. I'm out of here. Yeah. <laughs> Enough heck with you guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, now, Robert Scott Herrick asks, what keeps diverting the photons? Photons oh, yeah. carry um, information about the magnetic forces. So anytime they encounter something that's not neutral, a bare proton, a bare electron, they're going to interact with it. And so you don't have neutral hydrogen anywhere in the interior of the sun. You don't have neutral atoms. It's all plasma. And so the plasma means the positive and, the, and negative charges are separate. So the photon says, I'm going to go talk to you. I'm going to go talk to you. I'm going to go talk to you. So this is where the drunken you know, analogy works really well. You talk about two friends trying to leave a bar. The designated driver is like, I'm going to my car. I'm not talking to anybody. Bye. Right? The, the drunken person is like, you're my best friend. I love you. And this is every person on the way out of the bar. So the, the neutrino is like the designated driver. Just zip, go on. I'm in my car. Come on, please. Please oh my god, I'm so right. using this analogy. Yes. And, from and, now on. And the Thank photon you. is more like the guy who's, you know, okay, everybody is my best friend. I love everybody here. I gotta say gonna goodbye to everybody, on. yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna <laughs> hang on everybody on my way out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So wow. it takes them much longer. And and there's also ab ab absorption processes. So periodically uh, an atom will go, whoa, photon, you're just the right color for me. And, and an Zip. electron will jump to a higher energy level and say, no, I hate you. And then Collapse down to a lower energy level and, and emit the photon in a random direction. Although that one's going to be rarer because, I mean, when these things form in the center yeah. of the sun, they're gamma rays. And so oh, the only thing they interact with is nuclei. And it has to be aimed just right to be able to hit a nucleus. So, yeah, this um, is more of a process further out. Okay, yeah, so here's the last question. Um, and this comes from Chris Midden. He says, in my fifth grade science class, the text always says temperature doesn't change until all matter has changed phase during a phase change. When we watch it's ice true. melt with a, when we watch ice melt with a thermometer, it doesn't seem to be this way. Is this just a problem with the way we are sampling the temperature? Yes, very locally. So I mean, the 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 is this, and you're you're on the surface of your ice cube, and so at that surface, it's zero degrees Celsius. Outside of that, you have some water molecules that are probably above zero degrees Celsius, and because it's liquid, it starts to mix in. So if you could Take a the, sample. Yeah, go ahead. The, the, the way to do this demo is get yourself one of those magnetic spinny um, latte making machines. So, and then remove the heating element. Ignore the, it, make no heat out of this. Or get a magnetic mixer, any one of these random kitchen appliances that has a rod at the bottom that magnetically spins at a bazillion miles per hour. Mix ice and water into this container stick your thermometer in the center, start the sucker spinning madly. You'll see that it becomes ice water at 32 degrees and it stays 32 degrees until all the ice is melted and then the temperature starts to go up, but you need to have that robust mixing occur. Right. Works pretty well with boiling water too. I mean, you'll notice bubbles yeah. form where the pan is in direct contact with the heat. But, and again, if you're doing this with a thermometer, it's not until the entire thing of water is at 100 degrees. So don't put the thermometer on the bottom where it's in direct contact with a burner. But you hold the thermometer up a little bit so it's in water. And it's not until you see it hit 100 Celsius or 212 Fahrenheit for the rest of the people in the U.S. watching this. It's not until that you watch the whole pan of water just start boiling over like crazy. So, um, so yeah, you can do it with freezing. You can do it with boiling. But either way, you can go back to your fifth grade science teacher and and hopefully give them a better demo and uh, for their, their kids or something. 
Yes. Awesome. Well, I, you know what? It's, uh, we've been at it an hour. I'm going to wrap it up. So thanks again, Pamela, for uh, giving of your brain. Thanks, Thad, and, and Nicole for jumping in and, uh, and adding a few more doctorates to this conversation. <laughs> really appreciate it. So, um, and uh, hey, what's, what's, what's happening next, Pamela? Uh, the next thing up is Wednesday's Education Hangout. Learning the Space. Learning Space. And uh, that's going to be hosted by Nicole and I and probably Georgia Bracey. I don't remember if this was the week she had a conflict. She may be out of, yeah, not around. But we're going to launch right. things. Literally launch yeah. the show by launching things. It's going to be awesome. Thursday, we're we're going to be debugging that tomorrow. Thursday, Planetary Society Hangout. Uh, Friday, we're doing the Weekly Space Hangout, where we uh, bring a big rundown of all the big space news. Uh, and then Sunday night, we do our virtual star party, where we hook up all the telescopes and show you the night sky, like we did last night. And it was awesome last night. i got to say, it was a fantastic night. So we had the moon, we had Jupiter, we had lots of deep sky objects. It was really great. So, uh, well, thanks, guys. Thanks for everyone watching, and we will see you all uh, next time. Sounds great. Bye. See ya.